We're doing a dig for a day, which is uh, one of the key elements of our project here is to involve the local community uh, and get people who wouldn't all, no, normally be involved in archaeology uh, and give them an opportunity to, to find out a little bit about it. We are at Embleton's Bog in Northumberland. It's also known as Newham Lough or Newham Fen. It was a prehistoric lake of considerable size who've, which formed probably between 16 and 17,000 years ago as the glacial ice receded in this region. It left a big block of dead ice that, that, that melted. Um, it filled in the little basin. We're doing some prospecting for what we hope will be some early prehistoric sites. We're in an area that uh, many thousands of years ago were lakes left by the glaciers. We have one just behind us which has been infilling right up until the modern period. Uh, there's still some standing water there today. One place that we know was greatly favoured by um, hunter-gatherers was tops of rivers, river mouths, um, uh, where the river discharges into a lake or a lake is entering the, the riverine channel and so forth. And this is why we selected this particular area. Um, there's a higher current, for instance, that makes static fish weirs attractive propositions for, for uh, catching food. Uh, there's, there's also uh, running water, meaning that it's just represents less of a, a risk for infection and animals often come to the lake and river edges to feed making hunting easier. Uh, add to that waterfowl and so forth and you can see that it would afford you with all the subsistence opportunities that you would want. Also they would be very good places for navigation, that you could navigate from settlement to settlement because they would be in salient points. And now we assume that, again that many people would have chosen to travel by canoe or, or some sort of uh, water vessel because carrying all your goods on your back over unbroken woodland is very, very hard work. Well, the peat formed from the edges of the lake moving inward, leaving open water in the interior. Uh, so we're trying now to cut through the peat at the edges, define the lake edge as it existed at different periods, and we were looking for evidence of, of uh, occupation, evidence of lake level change, so we could get organic sediments that could be radiocarbon dated. And we were very fortunate in that in one of the trenches we struck on a cobbled stone surface with flagstones as well, which may represent a destroyed burial cairn, it may be a kist burial underneath it, but it, it was also associated with two pieces of stone tools. Uh, both are waste products, but one of them um, has a chalky cortex to it. Now this flint cannot be local, it must have been imported. So now flint begins to be circulated in trade chiefly in the farming stone age, so the onset of the Neolithic at about 6,000 years ago. To give an example, some examples of the organic material that we've recovered, we probably have some aurochs bone. Uh, we are not certain whether this animal died a natural death or it was hunted. We have to send this off to the laboratory where Peter Rowley Conway at the University of Durham will make not only species determination but he'll also look for evidence of butchery and so forth that might be indicative of hunting. Um, nearer where the feature has arisen we have animal bone that probably derives from cattle. Uh, and more recently, in one of the test pits that, that uh, we've dug nearby, we've recovered brushwood that's washed into the edges of the lake, but in amongst that were hazelnut shells as well. And the hazelnut shells are, uh, are, are particularly exciting for us, not so much because of what they can tell us um, of the, the economic structure, but because they, die, uh, they fall within a year Therefore, they die and stop collecting carbon, and they provide us with a very good um, source of radiocarbon samples. We're pretty much doing test pitting right on the edge of the, the lake margin. 
We're starting from known dry land where we're going straight into clay deposits and then we're heading into the peat deposits. So the trench immediately behind me has been expanded because we've hit um, a series of features. So we're adding one more little test pit just today just to get an idea of how the stratigraphy of the lake infilling changes between our, our, our site right on what presumably is the edge of the lake and the deeper uh, wet deposits that's uh, been standing water in the path. You might want to grab yourselves some shovels and some mattocks. Which are those pickaxe like things? We, as a company, have three days where we can work for a charity, but we didn't want to be doing that sort of thing, we wanted to do something slightly different. And so we'd read in the paper about the Bamber Research Project came up with the idea and uh, hence got in touch. We're working with some volunteers from Accenture who are, I think in almost every case, are having their first ever experience of archaeology. Ah, it is. <laughs> well, rather than the usual team building events where you can actually go out and rafts, you know, pinballing, all that sort of thing we've done, we all know each other. Um, we wanted to do something to put back into the community and get something out out of the day ourselves. If we get one person today who, who learns something and is interested, uh, it'll be a, a good result. But it's always nice to get to you know to get the public involved in it. Maybe one of you guys as well. Or you four can maybe go down with those guys over there and open a new one. Easy. <laughs> Side, right? Ah. We're going to get one person on the mic here, one person on the mic there, and one person on the shovel. Maybe get the mic in the middle actually as well. Yeah, there's a mic here. Okay, so we'll just take a minute. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, how we did that? We'd miss everything. We'd yeah. cut through features. Not near me, Andrew. <laughs> Once we've gotten down below all the, the, the modern crap and we start getting the peat, uh, there'll be another job because it'll be shoveled into the sieve shake because we're looking for microliths, which are pieces of flint which could be that small. People basically see, sit on the lake margins with their big lump of flint napping away and all around them you get a scatter and then it gets walked away and bits fly further. So if you test pit out, you end up with, with a pit which uses three flints of lake, mm -hmm. ten, than 150 and you're, then you're virtually on top of it, you're actually sitting where the, the guy napped. Right, who wants to have a first go with the massive? Oh, sure. So hold it towards the end, we, like, use it as a like hoe, Saeed, yeah. <laughs> use it as a hoe and then just, I mean, at this level you're just practicing cutting with it and then with the, the spade or shovel chap, uh, cleans your loose out and straightens the edge. Yeah, so basically we're just going to take it down until we get to it, it'll start to turn black and that's the point where we'll start sieving it. And on that note, I'm trying to step back. <laughs> oh, 
and I think we'll take a, a spit of this off, put it through the sieve, see if anything shows up. So you might get something right on the top of the peat. Okay. If that doesn't produce anything, I think we'll, do, we'll take six inches of this out quickly, sieve it again, see if we can find any flints or anything that's coming down slow. But yeah, you can smell it. Oh, and you can see the material coming up. <laughs> Generally, lakes fill in from the edges to the centre, so the open water remains in the centre and the edges are slowly uh, infilled with sediment. First you get reeds growing and if the reeds aren't recut, the sediment gathers around it and they become terrestrial deposits. And therefore the peat forms above the occupation horizons as a rule. We've just got the top of the peat. Um, after lunch we'll do a bit of sieving see what shows up. But you can see that's already got bits of organic stuff appearing in it and it smells. It's no, that's just these lots. <laughs> <laughs> Look, there's a shower coming, so I think we ought to go. <laughs> Go on YouTube, we're, we're typing shaving with flint. <laughs> and yes, there are people that have put yeah, themselves yeah, on YouTube yeah, shaving with flint, <coughs> including a man I know, <laughs> who should be one of the first. Um, well, he wanted to prove that you could do it. And, it would have been easier just to go on his arm and remove a few hairs. Yeah, but he wanted. <laughs> Well, you know, YouTube brings the worst out of people, don't they? <laughs> <laughs> sort, of, sort of bravado. There you go. <laughs> That's just a hammer. Is it alright to have a go? Yeah, go, go right ahead. Just they are now. If you have a go, put on the goggles. Yeah. Right. Uh, we had a, a little talk about flints, uh, flint napping with Christian earlier. Learn how to um, try and make your own flint tool. <laughs> we weren't that successful, but we had a good go try. Think of it as just barely touching when you're doing this. Barely warm. Yeah, some of the stones really retain their heat. Yeah, it's really warm that one. So have a look. Just think of glancing it when you're doing it. Just a glance. It, put I'm it not like this. the right edge. I need to look to see how it's going to break. Tell you the truth, this is easily turning into a Corax. Which, believe it or not, are Ouch. nice just looking things, but they're quite Well, my fingers. Yeah. yeah. Waste oh. stuff in my neck. <laughs> oh, that was a bit empty. Women in hunting gathering tribe hunt too. Um, it, and it was something that was overlooked by the social anthropologists who came to visit them for a little while. Well, who would have prepared, who would have prepared the... I think there might be a general trend to women would do it more often because they would be they on be the, the hunt. Anyway. Yeah, they'd be on the hunt at the campsite with the children. Ooh, yeah. Things Ooh. of that sort. I need to get that bigger piece off. <laughs> See, I'm trying to get it all nice and free. <laughs> <laughs> you go, another blade for you. Go on, go hunt. No, that's a reconstruction. I was going to say. My friend made if I, I, that would end up in the, the National Museum of yeah. Denmark. Yeah. Oh, that's it's that's it made of? It's made of church. It's made of an American church. Yeah, it also looks like hard wax, doesn't it? It's really yes. unusual colour. It's that lovely um, Indiana hornstone, it's called. Oh, Let's say we're going to do a canoe. I have, yeah. Now. So, it's one of those bad, that's a good bit though. You're not actually oh, driving yeah, a force, it's just the weight of it that goes across. Just practice this. Yeah, that's it, that's good. Yeah, you can do it, can't you? Once you get them going with a few good strikes, what happens is that you can you can continue striking blade after blade. Again, look at that. 
look at the weirdness Ooh. of these shapes. <laughs> and this is just the formation of it. There's nothing you can do. Um, yeah. it, it's it's just the, how it's formed. Do you know? Anyone know what flint is actually made of? Flint and chart. Any guesses? So it's layers of something. Yep. It, it, it derives from organic. It derives from dead sea creatures. It's all silica. And what happens is the silica, these creatures like Foraminifera and the protozoa in the sea, they have a silica shell and they die. The shell sinks to the bottom, it just builds up and up and up. And then as it's buried into other layers, the pressure forces it to solidify. It's called the calcium carbonate. That's why the coral is Yep, exactly. And if you look in here, you'll often see fossils. One of the greatest mass extinctions was in the Cretaceous period and it was of all these sea creatures. Um, and this is why you get these huge, huge deposits of, of, of this material, largely inexhaustible. This is difficult material to work with, so, so don't feel bad about not immediately achieving something. Firstly, because it's experience. All, you know, all you, if you break off some good flakes, that's a tool, and then the rest is refinement through this. The second thing you have to bear in mind is this flint is not the ideal flint. Um, people mined flint even in places with lots of decent quality flint, like uh, Grant's Graves. Have any of you ever heard of that? Not it's a it's a mine that goes about six meters deep. It was six thousand years ago they were mining flint. I wonder well, why would you bother? Well, the wetter the flint, the moist the it is, the better quality it is. Conversely, if you want to retain the quality, another thing you can do is heat it, and you heat it gradually, and it makes it more brittle. They, they say if you're going to make a fine tool, and these polished axes, for instance, take 30 hours to make. Same with these daggers, because the grinding of them is so, there's no easy way to do it. Now, modern times, we can use a grinding stone. No problems with that at all. That's where it takes all the time. But you don't want anything to go wrong when you've invested that amount of time. So one, they've suggested the thing you want to do is bake it. In the late Neolithic, they wanted to copy um, daggers of bronze with the, the leather stitching, but they only had small amounts of bronze in circulation. But you could not actually achieve this stitching with bone or antler or wood. And we worked out microscopically, and this was a um, great testament to the research that my friend has done. Um, he, he tried and tried everything he could to recreate the stitching with natural, well, with, with, with the most primitive, in inverted commas, materials, the bone, the wood, the antler. He could not do it. The only way he could do it was by putting a bit of copper at the end of it and doing it. And he said, that's the only way you can do it. And people were saying, no, it's the only, you think it is because you're not good enough. And he got the original Hinsgaul dagger, it's called, in Denmark. It's at the National Museum. And they put it under the scanning electron microscope, and lo and behold, they found a whole series of copper scars. Wow. Was, and, and it is this, the, you know, people will, you might have a bit of metal in circulation, and we do in fact have metal circulating in the last hunter-gatherer societies in Northern Europe, that because further south in Europe, because agriculture moves from the south east to the northwest mm -hmm. in Europe. The earliest agriculture in, in Eurasia is in uh, the Middle East, in, in the Fertile Crescent. You know, that's where they domesticated um, things like uh, wheat, barley, cattle, and so on. And you've got people in Southern Europe and Central Europe that are agriculturalists, while the people here are, far, are, are, are hunters. But they're still in communication with they're getting some of the materials. So some of the copper is creeping up into our part of the world and they're using it to make tools. They probably want the tools just for the sake of ostentation and for the sake of uh, uh, status demonstration that, you know, I have a copper tool and you don't, that sort of... <laughs> <laughs> the copper quite soft. It is very soft, yes. But it's, it's still... It, the metal's enough to knock these off, but as a tool, actually, in the Bronze Age, it's a bit of a misnomer. Um, we, we call it the Bronze Age, but in the advent of the Bronze Age, there's bronze in circulation, and they're making beautiful axes and swords. The only problem, you know what the problem with the are? is they're useless. <laughs> they're too soft, exactly, because the copper bronze is an alloy of tin and copper. And they would make these beautiful things to carry around. You'd have a beautiful sword and a shield 
and, and, and a helmet, but when it actually came to cutting your meat and doing everyday things, you, you picked up your piece of flint. <laughs> and this continued right to the middle of the Bronze Age until they began to alloy bronze with other things. And this is how iron was discovered, for instance. They began to alloy it to make it harder. So really, the, 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 the Bronze Age, for a good half of the Bronze Age, flint and other stone materials remain just as important and it's because bronze is not terribly good it's too soft it's good for something certainly um, but um, if you were fighting cutting something cutting down trees most of the bronze tools you have are just not good enough and you would still resort to the the flint and and other materials that are available in the landscape if, if you were to um, uh, actually do any serious work so it continues. And do you know, do you know when the last use of flint in Britain was? It was an industry that continued into the 18th century. And it was mainly based at the Royal Armory, Armory of Brandon, Norfolk, where they were creating gun flints. Hi, my name is Alison Davis. Um, within Accenture, I'm a client service analyst, CSA for short. Um, I'm Tina Kelly, I'm the Oracle team lead on the RPA project, the Rural Payments Agency. Um, I'm Ian Pilkington and I look after all the releases on the RPA project and I think today was just a matter of coming out and doing something different and seeing what it's all about. I'm Shiva, I am an enlistor there, so I came here to volunteer to find over the archaeology uh, to do for a day. Hello, I'm Malcolm Doyle, I work in Accenture and uh, it's a small team that are responsible for delivering changes for the Rural for Payments Agency. Hi, I'm uh, David Darlington, I'm, I'm the service delivery lead at Accenture, so I look after all these uh, boys and girls in the office. We now are um, I don't know quite what you call it, digging in the trench, <laughs> looking, uh, sort of starting off at the, the, the layers and going down to the, through the peat, to the peat layer and we, we've learned about the different sort of colours and what they mean and we're hopefully going to come across something a little bit interesting just in front of us here. We've concentrated on two main things. We've looked at how the, the sort of uh, the local people, sort of thousands of years ago, to use some of the local sort of rocks and broken them up to make sort of uh, sort of sort of um, implements to cut things and sort of arrowheads and things like that. And we're currently trying to dig a lovely hole in the uh, the Northumberland countryside. We've just been building. Well, taking these off the flint and building what I believe are called scrapers, and they're very sharp. So if you guys have cut the fingers up there, but uh, all good fun. We've got invited along, delighted to come along and just see such a lovely place and, uh, and learn a little bit about the history of the area. To actually look in and see where the lakes are, you can actually look at the land now and try and work out what it was in, in years gone by, so that's quite useful. I think we'll, we'll all look at the land in future and think about it a bit more rather than just take it for granted. Um, I suppose one of the things we've got out of today is learning about how the land was formed and all the layers and the ages of the layers. Uh, I find something. I feel that we find something good, you know, which it is for the good for the history. So hopefully we'll find something out. Yeah. As of yet, we've yet to experience the finding of something, but we found plenty of rotten wood. <laughs> it's always good when you office life sat on your backside all the time. It's nice to get out with the fresh air and do something different. That this is the first time I've done something like this in my life, and I'm sure it is for many of the other people. Here. So it's a unique experience within your, your local surroundings. Yeah, it's been great. Cool. I say, nice to get out of the office in the fresh air. We've been fortunate that it's still dry. I wouldn't, I'd do it again, yeah. I don't think it'd be a full-time job for me. I think I'm too in impatient, but, <laughs> but I'd definitely have another go. I'd have fun doing it, yeah. It was very interesting, and it is interesting. It's digging is more interesting, and we are finding out something new. These are off the, the bigger pieces of flint, which we've just like bashed off and then just sharpened them up a little bit, yeah. So to try and use them as a tool, so that we're trying to cut the meat tonight at the restaurant with these.
guys are now. I got a picture of you work. I would say we're not going to find anything much more of a rock. I know. Don't tell them. We were querying the flint, weren't we? I know, flint! I'm going to go swinging around with more my way now. Low-paid career with no prospects. Oh, it gets worse. Somebody believe me. Rocks and rocks and rocks. Need to do those gardens. Get Sean on it. Okay, <laughs> suffering a bramlet pot with. <laughs> when you watch us doing it, you're like, oh god, oh, like this, and we're playing into it. No, the wincing was me. <laughs> I was wincing watching you. Yeah. <laughs> oh. well, I don't know what it is. No idea? <laughs> don't know what it is yet. Yep. Just as good as anything I have. Just yeah. fancy taking a pile of stones one day and there. Uh... It's a punishment. Yeah. Have to be sharp edged, have to be angular. Sorry? Yeah, no, this can't be natural. You know, running water carries, it size sorts things naturally. This is all cobbled lying, it should not happen. If, if this was a natural thing, it should continue in a long streak, like a riverbed, if it was carried by, so, so this, this is something else, but we don't know what it is. Nice. Well, we're going to straighten it up, yeah. and what we hope for is we can see the layers as you see them here. And we're going to be able to, well, it probably won't tell us exactly what it is, but we, we can gauge the depth at which we're going to go. Mm -hmm. Maybe we can get some artifacts out of it, you know, correlated with a clear level. And if it is, <coughs> um, that'll give us a relative date for it at least. So I, I think it must it seals the paving. It does. It, this bit, doesn't it? Because this is must be this must be standing on the paving. Yeah. I've got that stick. Yeah. All I can think of is cairn. Yeah. Could be a burial cairn. Mm. Be covered. Mm. Sorry, they're not haunted. Mm. <laughs> Only old houses are. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh. See, there's another one poking up. No. So yeah. That's basically the paved area, just eroded stones, just a spread of them, just about a little over a metre. So we don't know whether it's the, the floor surface, a hard standing. There's quite big gaps in between though, isn't yeah. there? Yeah, I mean presumably it's, it's just gone down there, they could have had brush matting or something over it if it's a working surface. It could have been literally just to stop them sinking in the ground. They get close together over there yeah. as well, so in the middle. But we're clearly above where they are there, so yeah. that goes down yeah. slope towards the lake margins. I do declare there might be rain on the Yeah, I think you're right. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Well, one way or another, I want to do more, whether we get the funding or not. The only hypotheses we can add to is, um, as Deb said, po possibly an aggregate for, for a, a pathway leading to a foundation, mm. but it's so terribly thick. Yeah. It's, it, I, I don't know what the use of so much stone would be, unless it's because of the periodic um, uh, inundation that it, it could keep it uh, 
stable and dry. The other option is that we might be looking at, at a cairn of some sort. Um, but this, what we see here currently doesn't seem to have very much structure. Mm -hmm. It's uh, not at all well compacted. Yes. I think we, we're going to have to tidy it clean in one go, aren't we? And then get it photographed and go yeah. on. Get, do a the section problem is, right is to it. shove that in there. Yeah. It's coming from the as well. You're right, it's, it's, uh, it. it's a job for um, trowel spoon yeah. brush, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It's not a, it's not a spade. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's ten to five. I think we call it a day. Yep. Come back and solve the conundrum another time. Dying to find out what it is.